Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for coming here today to listen to these few words of mine. And before I start, I'd like to say how I appreciate uh, being here in what I might describe as hallowed portals with Admiral Sprintz's flag at the back. It's, uh, I find personally very uplifting and I hope the students and everyone here does the same. Here we have, as uh, John has just so rightly said, British treaties with China and Japan. HMS Furious, we will be introduced to her now. She was sim simply the gubernator gubernatorial yacht by which uh, means Lord Elgin was able to uh, move around the east. And there she is uh, in England before uh, leaving. This is taken from the Illustrated London News. As you can see, a paddle wheel uh, steamer, wooden built, very small ship, uh, 1,500 tons, and by modern standards, a huge crew, 220 officers and men. Um, <coughs> steam was used only, generally speaking, for navigation in confined waters, such as entering harbors and that sort of thing. For long passages, she would proceed under sail. And in 1857, the year before we are talking about, um, she was commanded by Captain Sherard Osborne, shown here as a rear admiral. I include him particularly because in, uh, <coughs> earlier in his life, he'd made quite a name for himself. Rather to the north of us, uh, the Northwest Passage era, the British in the uh, 1800s were endeavoring to see if there was a route from the Atlantic to the Pacific around the north of Canada. And they sent Sir John Franklin on an expedition uh, in the 1840s, and he was never seen again. So uh, Sherrill Osborne was a member of a couple of the subsequent expeditions, 1850 and 1854, to endeavor to track down Sir John Franklin in his ill-fated expedition. And it transpired later that he had died in 1847. And uh, while we're on the subject of the Northwest Passage, though it's got nothing to do with the talk, um, good modern day Arctic transit economics uh, described in proceedings. I'm sure some of you take proceedings. Uh, this year, the July 2013 edition, very nice article by Stephen Carmel on the modern day economics of that still dubious route. Uh, page 38 in proceedings, July this year. Subsequently, he had distinguished himself, Captain Osborne had distinguished himself during the Crimean War, 1853 to 1856 when he commanded the sloop Vesuvius in the Sea of Azov. So he had a history of, uh, of a bit different from the normal run. And straight away we uh, take here from the ship's logbook an extract, 4th of May 1857. Uh, this is just before she set sail from England. You can see here lit fires and weighed at 11.30. And one of the principal objects of her proceeding east was to escort these 12 small uh, gunboats. They'd been built for use in the Crimean War in shallow, confined waters. And the uh, Crimean War just ended, as I've said. And it was perceived that their use would be, good use would be made of these craft in similar shallow waters on the China Station. As I say, she left England on the 4th of May down to Madeira, if you can imagine, across to Rio. And then a huge route around from Rio to Java Head, um, right round the tip of South Africa, didn't touch in South Africa at all. And Java Head, as you know, is on the western tip of Java between Java and Sumatra, by Karamata there. A uh, huge, huge passage. And then up the Borneo coast, across to Hong Kong, and uh, the last ship in was firm, escorted by Furious, arrived in Hong Kong on the 22nd of November. So from 4th of May to 22nd of November to escort that small flotilla to the east. Now, as befits the era, my reference to Chinese names will be according to Wade Giles' Romanization and not the modern system. Basically, the trouble had arisen in the Far East in October, as early as October 56, when the Chinese authorities at Canton, in the south of China, had seized a small craft, or launcher called Arrow, uh, lowered the British flag and arrested the crew, a number of whom they accused of being pirates. And you can imagine, the British were infuriated by this illegal act. And in part owing to the strong characters of two of the men involved, Sir John Baring, who was governor of Hong Kong at the time, and the imperial viceroy, Ye Ming Chen. He was viceroy in that southern part of China based at Canton. Both very strong, powerful personalities, 
generally tension and violence escalated. And the whole uh, pot was kept boiling, or had been already started boiling, earlier in 1856 when a French missionary, Auguste Chapdelaine, had been murdered next door to Canton Quangxi province. The French were outraged, pretty obviously. The long and the short of it being that the French and the British, recent allies in the Crimea, now became allies to deal with what they perceived to be the problem in, in China, mostly deriving from the controversial opium trade. It was these latter acts, the Arrow Affair and the murder, that proved to be the final pieces of straw that broke the camel's backs, the patience of the two European powers. With tension escalating, the British appointed their highly regarded administrator and colonial governor, James Bruce. He held two titles. His primary title was 8th Earl of Elgin, and also he was a 12th Earl of Kincardine, both in Scotland there. And he was uh, dispatched east as their plenipotentiary, which means he had the authority to basically do what he liked. He was overall supreme commander over all British interests in the east. And here we have a map. We'll get down to details in a moment. Just briefly, there's uh, the Sea of Azov, where uh, Captain Osborne had made his name in the shallow waters just to the um, east of the Crimea. Suez Canal had not been built, only going to be opened in 1869. So Lord Elgin made uh, his way to Suez, crossed over land to Suez on the south side of the Isthmus, and took passage to Gaul in the P&O ship Bentinck. And while he, when he arrived in Gaul, um, which was on the 26th of May, so just about the time that uh, Osborne was sailing from England, he first heard of the outbreak of the Indian mutiny, which had broken out at Meerut, 40 miles from Delhi, just a few days earlier on the 10th of May. At this early stage, no one was quite sure of the seriousness or otherwise of the problem. Gaul was the port of entry slum those days. At Colombo, the breakwaters had not been uh, built and there wasn't a harbor there. Gaul was the old harbor. In fact, if you ever go there, there's rather a splendid uh, old Portuguese fortification still maintained. Ma magnificent uh, um, memory of days gone by, long, long ago. Anyway, from Gaul, he proceeded to Singapore in the p and ship Singapore and uh, <coughs> There he arrived on the 3rd of June, and it was at Singapore that he heard from his uh, old Corpus Christi Oxford uh, university colleague, university uh, uh, contemporary, that the mutiny was proving to be quite serious. It wasn't just a, uh, a little unrest with the natives, it was an important general uprising. Immediately, in a magnanimous gesture for which in due course he was to receive much credit, Lord Elgin ordered that all the troops dispatched east in support of his own missions to China and Japan be diverted to help uh, George Canning in India. And then his lordship continued on from Singapore to Hong Kong to uh, see how the land was, how the land lay there, and to order troops from Hong Kong also to India to uh, assist in the, the British effort there within that country. His Lordship also visited India himself, and it was only in September uh, 1857 that he was able to return to Hong Kong to get on with his own business, that of China and Japan. That was, uh, I say, in September. Shortly thereafter, on the 22nd of November, Furious, having rounded from Rio, this huge passage round to Java Head, there, as I've mentioned, on the western tip of Java, this, uh, and up the coast here, the Borneo coast, you have to take this passage up past Palawan and across from uh, Luzon to um, Hong Kong. And Furious, Furious, as I say, arrived there on the 22nd of November with Firm, the last of the little gunboats of those 12. All of them escorted safely, by the way. They're small and, of course, mighty uncomfortable in any sort of a sea, but the advantage is that anyone who's served in small ships, you're a bit like a cork, you bob around on top and there's very little risk of harm coming to you unless there's an overwhelming uh, waves or something of that nature. Prior to commencing negotiations with the Chinese in Peking, Beijing today, the seat of the emperor was in the north and we're talking about this area here. Remember the trouble the French and the British were having 
with the uh, <coughs> Viceroy down in the Canton, just adjacent to Hong Kong, the British and French perceived that that should be attended to first. Uh, consequently, on the 28th of December, the bombardment of Canton commenced. Commissioner Lier was captured uh, just a few days later, on the 5th of January, 1858, so we're into our year now. And he was sent into exile in Calcutta, where he died in April 59. In, in, in passing, there's quite a nice, not, it's not flippant, there's quite a nice little tale about uh, taking Ye into exile. Uh, the ship which took him was inflexible, a small sloop commanded by George Brooker. And George Brooker uh, wrote subsequently, on finding himself in the ship, Ye asked if he might be so bold as to inquire if it was intended that he should be executed. On being assured that such was not the case, the story goes that then he settled in to make himself as comfortable as possible with whatever food and drink the ship's galley was able to provide. So he was uh, looking after number one in fair style. Having dealt with the problems there, it was time for Lord Elgin to proceed to the north. Uh, accordingly, from Canton, he addressed uh, an a letter to the seat of the Manchu power Chinese Manchu power in Peking, outlining the terms of a proposed treaty. Although they had not participated in the occupation of Canton, this communication to the emperor was made on behalf of Russia and the USA, in addition to the active allies, France and Britain. So you see already uh, general coming together as a common uh, political bodies, the Western powers, to uh, try and attend to matters in China. This is 1858. This was by no means Britain's first treaty with China. For example, one of the first historic treaties had been at Nanking in August 1842, when it was agreed that various trading ports could be set up by and used by the, the foreigners. Wednesday, the 3rd of March, 58, in Furious, now embarked in his yacht with his suite, Lord Elgin sailed from Hong Kong and with stops at the various uh, treaty ports, Sweta, Amoy, Fu Cha Ningpo made his way to Shanghai, where he arrived on the 26th of March. So he took about three weeks going up the coast. This next illustration just serves to indicate the proximity of Canton to Hong Kong. Uh, Kowloon on the mainland, Victoria on the island, and the rather tricky channel, a channel which should, by any competent body, have been defended very ably, but in this particular occasion, the Allies, as I've mentioned, were able to uh, start their, commence their bombardment of Canton on the 28th of December, and in just a week they'd cap captured Ye. So the Chinese, Manchu Chinese resistance, was pretty limited. And this was the first port of uh, uh, call on the 4th of March as he made his way up the coast in Furious. And I put this in, any navigators here will know of the Cape of Good Hope in Southern Africa. Well, here's another one in those days in, uh, on the coast of China. Not unexpectedly, when he reached uh, Shanghai, Lord Elgin received the most unsatisfactory reply from the Chinese authorities. Knowing that any delay would be interpreted by the Chinese as e indicating a weakness of resolve, the Allies, the French being under the command of Baron Gros, their commissioner extraordinaire, made arrangements to continue on towards Pei Ho, which is at the mouth of the river, is the river mouth leading up in the vicinity of Peking. It doesn't actually touch Peking. And the general area at the mouth of Peiho is known as Taku. A couple of days prior to leaving Shanghai on the 10th of April, his lordship requested the British CNC, who was Rear Admiral Sir Michael Seymour, send all available gunboats to the Peiho. As there he knew, and extract from his diary, they would be indispensable if it should be necessary to ascend that river to Tianjin. So you can see his lordship had been well advised and had done his homework. These are very shallow waters. And we'll see in a moment the entrance to the Peiho is indeed extremely shallow. All of us are familiar with the phrase, blood is thicker than water. It was off the Peiho in June 1859 when the British were having a very hard time of it. But although he was officially neutral, Commander Josiah Tatnell in the United States Navy, entered the fray by entering some much appreciated assistance to the British. That was his explanation for breaking neutrality rules. Blood is thicker than water. So it was that the next year, 1860, a third expedition was necessary, and that was uh, an overwhelming success. 
And just to bring that, in, that date into perspective, remember, here in the United States, the Civil War commenced the following year, 1861. So this is the area we're talking about, the mouth of the Pehu at Taku, Taku, seven or eight miles off in those very shallow waters here at the uh, uh, western tip of the Gulf of Chile. There's Tintin a short distance upstream. And as I say, uh, the Pehu Pass is close by Peking, but doesn't actually uh, enter the city. I've stressed, Manchu occupied China. They'd conquered China in the 17th century, and they were to continue to rule China until 1910, 1911. And Sun Yat-sen is all a different subject, of course. Very interesting subject, but we certainly don't have time today. Lord Elgin proceeded ashore to Tenzin, where the treaty negotiations were to take place, knowing in advance that he was to deal with a devious and untrustworthy people, his lordship adopted an uncompromising pose. He was imperial Britain uh, at its worst or at its best, depending on your point of view. The Manchu Chinese particularly objected to two clauses, namely that free intercourse was to be established to all parts of China for trading purposes, and that a British minister would be entitled to reside in Peking. You can imagine the horror that that idea was received. The day before the treaty was due to be signed, the two Chinese envoys even went so far as to say that if Lord Elgin insisted on these two clauses being retained, they would lose their heads. As his lordship wrote in his diary, he was not influenced by this novel weapon in the diplomatic armory. The terms of the treaty remained intact, and so as it happened did the necks of the gentleman in question. The Treaty of Tenzin was signed with Great Britain on the 26th of June, 1858. 26th of June. Similarly, the French, Russians and Americans were to reach agreement with China. In addition to an indemnity being paid, a number of new trading ports were to be opened, including in the Yangtze, as far upstream as Hankar. And I put that in uh, especially to remind us all how very radical that was. The interior of empire, Hankar is 636 sea miles up the Yangtze in the inland of China. So that was a gigantic step, a gigantic concession for them to make to the uh, hideous British. Subsequently, his lordship embarked in Furus on the 6th of July out here. The attempt was made to view the uh, tourists now, Shanghai Guan, where the Great Wall enters the sea or comes to the seashore. But it was a vile day with uh, drizzling rain and low cloud so without further ado, Commander, uh, Captain Osborne ordered, altered course and they made their way to Shanghai where they arrived on the 12th of July. Now some of you I'm quite sure have been to Shanghai, 14 miles up the Wangpu here, 45 miles down to the open sea, Yangtze here, and that's the way up to Hankar, another 600 odd sea miles. So you come up from the sea, South China, this is all a bit shallow, Port your helm in past Wusang, 14 miles up, and there's Shanghai. Even in those early days, was showing signs of developing to become the greatest trading and shipping center in China, which it is today. And just to, just to add emphasis to that remark, we were there in 2008, so a little while ago, and two or three of the guides told us that all the construction cranes, we could see on every, every angle in Shanghai, half the construction chains in Asia were in Shanghai at that time. Quite incredible. The situation now was there remained a couple of small tariff details to be sorted out in connection with his lordship's recent diplomatic success at Tianjin. The total uh, uh, tone of the relevant uh, communications received from China, Chinese was positive, but it would take a few weeks for the envoys to reach Shanghai. Encouraged by the cooperative attitude of those empowering Peking and perceiving that he had sufficient time in hand, Lord Elgin now decided to proceed with the second part of his mission to Japan. Accordingly, on the 31st of July, he re-embarked in uh, Furious. Captain Osborne weighed early in the morning, down into the Yangtze, starboard his helm, and off towards Nagasaki in Kyushu, which we'll see now. Shanghai to Nagasaki, short distance, 450 sea miles. And here's the port we're talking about, Kyushu, Honshu, Shikoku's just here, Strait of Shimonoseki, Korean Strait, 
Tsushima, south coast of Korea. This is the scene of Togo's great victory in, in 1905. Um, Hirada I put in because that was the first um, trading station permitted by the Japanese in early days when the British, Portuguese and Dutch came to trade there. The Portuguese had arrived here in 1543, so just 55 uh, years after their amazing achievement in rounding the Cape, the first European uh, power, if you like, to proceed to the east by sea. And just 55 years later, they had reached uh, Tanegashima, another one of their amazing achievements in that very, well, difficult era. The Portuguese had brought with them Catholicism, which the Bakufu, the uh, government of uh, the shogunate, didn't like. So they were banished. Uh, the British didn't make any money, so they left. And in 1641, the uh, uh, shogunate said that the Dutch should proceed and establish their base there, at their trading station there at uh, Nagasaki. The, as I've hinted, the Japanese leadership of the day consisted of the shogunate, the Tokugawa shogunate, three families, the Tokugawa shogunate. And Ayasada was a shogunate, a shogunate at that time, and his government, the Bakufu. The emperor himself, who was Komai at the time, lived in virtual, virtual isolation in Kyoto. He held a curious position, hereditary and respected, but virtually powerless. For well over 200 years, from this tiny island in Nagasaki Bay, Shima means island, Deshima there, it was an artificial creation, that tiny little island. For well over 200 years, the Dutch were confined to that trading post. And they were permitted one or maybe two, three trading vessels a year from the capital of their East Indian uh, Empire in Batavia, or Jakarta as it's called nowadays. 200 years of isolation. With various, it wasn't enforced rigidly by all the shoguns according to their particular feelings and interests. Some who were interested in outside activity encouraged the Dutch a little more. This era of isolation only was to begin to end with the visit of Commodore Matthew Calbraith Perry, United States Navy, to Japan on the 8th of July, 1853, as uh, John indicated earlier. He brought with him an introduction from President Millard Fillmore. Although isolated, the policy which the succession of shoguns pursued with varying degrees of intensity, the Bakufu, the shogunate government, were not uninformed. From both British and Chinese sources, they knew of much that was going on in the outside world. They knew of British military success in China. They knew of the Chitri of Nanking of 42, and of the British very recent achievement in, of June 1858 at the Peiho. Similarly, from Dutch sources, they had known in advance that from the USA, Perry was coming in 1853, and in due course was to sign his treaty at Kanagawa, which he did the following year, 31st of March, 1854, as John indicated. One of the clauses agreed to by the Japanese covered the residence of an American consul in Japan. The first was Mr. Townsend Harris, who was appointed by President Franklin Pierce and who took up his post in the summer of 1856, so just two years before the period we're talking about. Following Perry's success in, later in 54 at Nagasaki, the British Commander-in-Chief, Rear Admiral Sir James Sterling, negotiated a simple, straightforward, seven-point agreement with the Japanese. In reaching this agreement with the Bakufu officials here at uh, Deshima, he had been greatly assisted by the Dutch headman, Mr. Donker Curtius. In addition to his efforts in China, before he left London, Lord Elgin also had been instructed to obtain a treaty with Japan, the usual terms covering trade, right of residence, diplomatic representation, and so on. In other words, Admiral Sterling's agreement needed to be updated. And here Furious arrived in Nagasaki Bay on the 3rd of August, 1858. And these are extracts from uh, Lord Elgin's diary, which are just three little uh, paragraphs which I've included, because I think quite interesting. Very true, no one can deny. Secondly, I've just had a visit from the Vice Governor of Nagasaki. One of his own suite did the interpretation. They are the nicest people possible. None of the stiffness and bigotry of the Chinese. I gave them luncheon. It was wonderful how they managed with knives and forks and all other strange implements. 
then the next day. I went to show yesterday and this morning chiefly to make purchases. Things are really beautiful and cheap. The town is wonderfully clean after China. Not a beggar to be seen. The people clean too. You can see straight away that Lord Elgin is making, quite obviously, making a contrast between the two peoples and uh, generally speaking at this particular stage coming up with favorable impression of uh, the Japanese. And here's the country. Um, this is the area we're talking about here on the western tip of Kyushu, Nagasaki there. Uh, Cape Chikakov in the south will come to now, Korea and, and here's uh, Tokyo. Yedo is the, the name of the town. Tokyo just means eastern capital. Um, and here's Shimoda, a little distant from uh, Tokyo, but very close compared with the Dutch who had to make this long trip every time they wanted to negotiate with the, uh, or were invited to negotiate with the shogunate. You didn't tell them what you wanted, you asked them. Mr. Donker Curtis was not president, present at Deshima at the time that Lord Elgin was there. As can be imagined, with the appointment of the first American consul, Mr. Townsend Harris, who was permitted to live here at Shimoda, there arose an element of competition between Holland and the USA, each country endeavoring to outdo the other in securing improved trading conditions. At about the time in June 58 that the British were leading the Allies in their conquest at the Pei Ho, that uh, both Mr. Curtis and Mr. Harris were here in Yeddo trying to seek improved benefits. Neither were successful, the Bakufu were not listening. By virtue of living relatively close by, Mr. Harris was able to return to Shimoda rather quickly. Whereas for Mr. Curtis, this journey back to Nagasaki took six weeks. In the event, Mr. Harris very quickly received news, obviously, of the Allied success at Peho in June knowing that the Bakufu were concerned that maybe next the British would turn their attention to Japan, while Mr. Curtis was still en route back to Nagasaki, Mr. Harris quickly nipped over to Yeddo. There he stressed the obvious, that while the British, when the British came, it was likely they would seek to obtain from the Bakufu rights of settlement, trading and other conditions somewhat similar to those which they had won in China. However, if now the Japanese signed a modest treaty with the USA, then that could be taken as a base point from which negotiations should start. In that way, the terms which the British would insist upon were not likely to be so onerous as that achieved by them with the Chinese. The Japanese would have a useful point of precedent from which to commence their talks with the British. Good point. There was dissent within the Bakufu, but the important members saw the the uh, point of the argument put forward by Mr. Harris, and on the 29th of July, signed a treaty with the USA. Lord Elgin only remained here in Nagasaki till the 5th of August, then he proceeded in Firas, making his way in this direction. However, the following day, when they attempted to round Chikakov at the south end of Kaushu, the seas were vile. Remember, Firas was a small ship, only 210 feet in length. One member of uh, Lord Elgin's suite was the Private Secretary Lawrence Oliphant, who has left copious notes of all these travels. And he writes of their attempt the following day, when the seas had abated somewhat, to successfully round the uh, Chikakov. And we were underway in a few minutes with blinding wind and sea in our teeth, and our bows under at every heave. The huge pointed rocks off Chikakov loomed black and threatening in the thick darkness and we could hear the waves roaring against them as we struggled past this point. I don't think anyone's left in any doubt that he wasn't one of the happiest souls on board. In the event, all went well, and they arrived off Shimoda on the 10th of August. And there they were followed into port by another of Her Majesty's ships, Retribution, together with the steam yacht Emperor. At the suggestion of Admiral Stilling, the yacht had been built as a present from Queen Victoria to the Japanese head of state. Admiral Seymour, the CNC, and Lord Elgin had come to an arrangement whereby on behalf of the CNC, his lordship would deliver this yacht to Yeddo at the appropriate moment. At Shimoda, Lord Elgin obviously visited Mr. Townsend Harris, with whom he got on very well. From Mr. Harris, he learned of the conditions of the treaty signed between Japan and the USA just a fortnight earlier. His lordship instantly appreciated the tactics employed by Mr. Harris in his negotiations 
with the Bekufu. At the same time, he felt that in the few weeks available to him, then there was the terms and conditions would prove acceptable to Great Britain. A good start would be made if Great Britain and Japan could rather quickly agree to similar terms in their treaty. In other words, Mr. Harris's perceptive argument had paid off as far as the United States was concerned. In addition, Mr. Harris was kind enough to offer to Lord Elgin the services of his translator, Enricus Huskin, the only European language understood by the few Japanese who were permitted to have outside uh, touch with outside influences was Dutch, and Mr. Huskin, therefore, with knowledge of English, Dutch, and Japanese, was able to provide a most valuable service. As he had done at Nagasaki, also at Shimoda, his lordship entertained the governor on board. The Japanese attempted, once again, to restrict the Europeans to Nagasaki. Of course, the wrong man, Lord Elgin, had nothing to do with that. This next illustration is just a quick four-year deviation. 1849, Perry indeed had anchored off Uraga in 53 and had been the pioneer as far as modern-day negotiations were understood. But as part of their normal prying and pressing and uh, looking around, the British had been then conducted an earlier survey, very brief survey, just a couple of days of these waters four years earlier, HMS Mariner, Commander Charles Matheson. I just put that in as a little sense of perspective, that's all. No, no diplomatic effort at, at all. This is the more famous uh, map, modern map of Perry's fantastic efforts. These dotted waters are waters he surveyed as far north as Beacon Point, Haneda Airport uh, of today. Mississippi was one of his ships. Uh, Point Fillmore, cleverly supporting his president. An island named after himself, why not? And this is where Uraga is, where Perry had anchored in July and then proceeded the following year to Kanagawa, where his treaty had been signed. I put Yokohama in, or it's in, not because it was significant then, it was just a couple of mud huts, but it was become important because off Yokohama there was uh, deeper water, so better for European ships. But that's the fantastic uh, effort made by Perry with the huge surveying uh, undertaking earlier uh, before Lord Elgin arrived. This is the British update of 1858, uh, Osborne's, Captain Osborne's survey. This is the limit of uh, Perry's navigation off Beacon Point. Here's Kanagawa, Yokohama, just to bring things into perspective. Lord Elgin, of course, being an experienced diplomat, well knew the value of doing the unexpected. With leads going, command, Captain Osborne pioneered this first passage up to that point, past Kanagawa, past the limit of Perry's soundings, and horror of horrors, up towards Yeddo itself, where no Western ship ever before had ventured. Absolutely correct. Nothing like it had ever been seen before in Japan, nor even been contemplated as a, mo as, as a most remote possibility. Remember, two centuries of isolation, no foreigners allowed in, and no uh, Japanese allowed out. Appalled, the various Japanese officials who were permitted to board Furious tried their best to persuade his lordship to return to Kanagawa. They knew there wasn't a chance of getting him back to Nagasaki, but at least they tried to get him to go to Kanagawa. Here's a metal, um, we see something of the metal of the man. Not only did Lord Elgin refuse, but actually gave instructions that the ship should proceed further in towards Yeddo, to that spot which I've outlined in blue. Just to bring things into perspective a bit, there's the Shogun's Castle today, the Imperial Palace. The waterfront, of course, is hugely different with land reclamation, and this red dot is the scene of the first British embassy. Um, but this is uh, the seat of uh, Shogunate Pa. In, ob in obedience to uh, Lord Elgin's instructions, Commodore uh, Captain Osborne sent out boats to sound, and the next day proceeded in further, just a mile off city limits and he trimmed the ship's draft to 15 feet, even keel, so he could get in within a mile. And there on the 14th, they were joined by the gunboat Lee, Commander William Graham. And Lee, of course, was one of those small gunboats Furious had escorted out from uh, England, 
And indeed, at the Peho was to be lost in 1859, uh, uh, along with a few other British warships against that fierce uh, Chinese defense. On 15th of August, a party of senior Japanese officials came on board furious. In the usual oriental manner, the question of face and status had to be considered. Earlier, a number of junior officials had been sent on board to attempt to negotiate with his lordship, but he had remained firm in his refusal to even meet with such representatives until men of appropriate rank were produced. And such a group appeared on the 15th of August. One member was a shogunate admiral, a very intelligent, well-bred man, according to the diaries, who showed himself to be familiar with aspects of the layout of Inferius, including her engine room even. Lord Elgin handed this group a draft of his proposed treaty. Also, discussions were held, held concerning the question of accommodation ashore for the first uh, British embassy. Now, straight away, Lord Elgin picked up divisions. In the course of these discussions, Lord Elgin quickly discovered that an element of disunity existed within the Bakufu and the Daimyo. The Daimyo were the right-wing conservative samurai leaders of their own fiefdoms, the Han, within Japan. And the Bakufu, by virtue of their uh, extra experience, if you like, with international dealings, were aware that those hard right-wing attitudes had to change, but there was dissension. And so straight away we just have another quick extract from his lordship's diary on the 16th of August. Chief interpreter told one of my part, the princes who have come off to me, those were the Bakufu members, the admiral and his colleagues, and this is the spirit of the government. But some of the hereditary princes, the samurai daimyo, are very much opposed to intercourse with foreigners, and that some little time ago it was apprehended they would raise a rebellion against the government in consequence of the concessions it is making. So Lord Elgin immediately picked up this potential division within the Bakufu administration. And then the last bit, of course, uh, pretending that his friends never believe a word they say. Well, that, that still goes on today, of course. Um, so here we see at the highest level in the British delegation intimation given surrounding domestic circumstances then prevailing within Japan. This is 1858. In just under 10 years, was to result in the end of the Tokugawa shogunate with the res resignation of Tokugawa Yoshinobu and the apparent revival of the power of the emperor, uh, Mutsuhito, the Meiji Restoration, 1868 to 1912. Just let me relate while we're on the subject of his lordship there in uh, Tokyo Bay, Yedo Bay, uh, with the visit various officials coming on board to see him. Remember, he was Earl of King Cardine and Earl of Elgin. In Japan at the time, it was the accepted custom for any official to be accompanied in all negotiations by his ametsuke, or eyes in attendance. In other words, a spy who was there to report any indiscretion, indiscretions or inappropriate conduct. So naturally, whenever Lord Elgin received Japanese guests on board the ship, they looked around discreetly to try to detect the ametsuke accompanying his lordship. Of course, none could be seen. However, when later they saw that he signed himself Elgin and Kincardine, then they supposed that the wily Kincardine, nowhere to be seen, was somewhere there keeping a secret eye on Elgin. On the 16th of August, here we are at this spot here, a mile off the city limits. The weather was poor, so his lordship did not proceed ashore, but instead sent members of his staff to inspect the proposed accommodation which was just a disused temple, which could be adjusted without much problem. On the 17th, the following day, Lee came into her own. Remember the small gunboat Lee had accompanied his lordship into Yellow Harbor, and she came into her own the following day, the occasion of the official landing. This was a magnificent procession, complete with officers in full dress, 13 ships boat in company with their crews all in their smartest dress, Salutes fired at appropriate times to both his lordship and 21 guns to the Empire of Japan and with bands playing. Once the depth of water reduced to seven feet, so firm could only go into about here when the water, level, water depth was too shallow, uh, about three miles, then his lordship switched to ship's boats and they rode up the coast to his landing point in approximately that vicinity, 
with considerable ceremony. You can imagine the bands, razzmatazz, glistening uniforms, therefore with much of the all-important face gained. Naturally, this was a sight then unique. Many thousands of citizens turned out to witness the extraordinary occasion. Once ashore, then, the British found their opposite numbers were businesslike and missed nothing in the course of their negotiations. Lord Elgin found that the Admiral, mentioned earlier, was the most intelligent and active member of the Bakufu delegation. Another envoy was the previous governor of Nagasaki, of course with exposure to wicked European thinking. When those two were in, in, were in agreement, then the remainder were usually content. All proceeded smoothly, and on the 23rd it was mutually agreed that the treaty would be signed on 26 August, two months to the day since he had secured his treaty with the Chinese at Tianjin. Also on the same day, the British gift, the Yacht Emperor, would be presented. That's pretty rapid diplomatic work. Not only that, but in a procedure quite unheard of, in, the Japanese also agreed to salute the British flag with 21 guns. On the 25th, Lord Elgin hosted a Japanese envoys to dinner, a most successful gathering complete with toasts and, they say, witty speeches. Some witty speeches in Japanese, some in English, some in Dutch. Imagine poor Mr. Huskin trying to translate and explain the subtleties. I think that's the wittiest part of all. The Dutch copy of the treaty was made the original, as that was the nearest to being a common tongue. 26 August was also the anniversary and the birth of 1819 of Queen Victoria's consort, Prince Albert. Therefore, at noon, Furious fired, fired a royal salute in his honour. The treaty was signed at 1 p.m., and at 4 p.m., for the first time in history, the Japanese saluted a foreign flag with 21 guns, being reciprocated by retribution and furious with the same number. Thereafter, the yacht was handed over with due ceremony, after which Captain Barker of Retribution hosted a feast on board for Japanese envoys. It wasn't a late night do. Lord Elgin returned to Furious by 7 p.m. that evening. Here they are, Tokyo Bay, Yedo Bay. No time was wasted by him in returning to Shanghai to resume his business in China. Having made his official farewells the previous evening, then early on the 27th, Furious weighed and proceeded to sea. Mr. Huskin was obviously dropped back at Shimoda that afternoon, and Furious returned directly to Shanghai, where she arrived on the 2nd of September, 1858. Before we leave Japan, here is the map of Japan as it was in those days with all the samurai uh, Han fiefdoms. And I've outlined in red there the important ones uh, the families of whom were instrumental in the restoration of the emperor and of overcoming the shogunate power after some 250 years. The four Han who are particularly important is uh, Choshu here, right at the western tip of uh, Honshu, on Toza here on Shikoku, down here the Shimazu family of Satsuma, and the Hizen here in the vicinity of Nagasaki. These were the four feudal daimyo who, if you like, saw that times needed to be changed. But of course there was a method in their madness. Earlier I made reference to the apparent restoration of the Meiji era. <coughs> in fact, the power behind the throne were the Shimazu family of Satsuma and the Mori family of Chosu. So they perceived changing times were coming and had cleverly stirred things, if you like, their way. Once the shogunate rule was overthrown, as I say, in early 68, the Meiji era commenced, and only in 1841 were the boundaries of these feudal fiefdoms to be altered to the modern prefecture system, or Ken administrative reasons, uh, regions. This is the last illustration. Um, again, an extract from Lord Elgin's diary. We are plunging into the China Sea and quitting the only place which I have left with any feeling of regret since I reached this abominable East. Abominable not so much in itself as because it is strewed all over with the records of our violence and fraud and disregard of right. So we see here, concerning his success in Japan, which had rather quickly followed his success in Tianjin, maybe Lord Elgin privately was much more liberal in outlook than his imperial behavior would seem to suggest. Thank you.
Yes, sir. Is this too early for Chinese Gordon? I hear nothing. Gordon, China Gordon, of the, the man who died in Sudan. No, yeah, yes, but early days. Early, that yes, name. it is. That, that's, that came afterwards. Yeah. That came with the end of the, towards the end of the uh, Manchu um, rule of China, the overthrow which took place finally in 1910-1911. So Gordon indeed was a little bit later. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. I've read several times that uh, the English introduced drugs to China to entertain the troops out there. Is this a fact? It was trade. In the, the opium was grown in India. It was a very good crop for India to export. The Chinese exported silver. silver. In fact, that was one of the reasons the Chinese were getting a bit upset about the opium thing. It was all the degradation of their people to some extent, but don't forget it was taken at the highest level too. So it wasn't just the peasants who took the opium, it went right up the scale of people. It wasn't only the degradation of people, it was the loss of silver to India. So it was uh, a trading. They, they wouldn't buy English woolens in China. They wouldn't buy anything else the uh, English made. They wouldn't trade with India, uh, with England, except with opium. So that indeed, that I mentioned earlier, uh, the opium disagreement with the opium trade. Where did you get the opium? It was grown in India, Bengal opium. India. Yeah, yeah. The, the bond uh, was used by the French in Shanghai. The French, the English, Everyone had, everyone had their international, uh, let me get the illustration up, um, everyone had their um, international, um, oops, sorry, oh how do I get rid of that, okay, okay there we go, everyone had their international uh, representation there in Shanghai, but the, the French settlement was they were the only European power to maintain their own French, even with French names in the streets. In fact, Sun Yat-sen, when he... Yes, oh, absolutely. When he went into exile, that was where he settled, in the, in the French Quarter. The rest were the Japanese, uh, the British, uh, Americans, other European powers. The Italians were there. The Italians had navy ships there. Spanish. Everyone had uh, representation of one sort or another. The British, dare I say, were by far the most important in that era but they lived outside the French Quarter. But you're right, the French Quarter is still there with a certain architectural identity, I think yeah, it's fair to say. Yeah, yeah. Idea, yeah. What's interesting about Shanghai is it's such a cosmopolitan city today as a result of this period. Oh, absolutely. It was, it was the international spot, absolutely. And uh, in fact, on the Bund, the, uh, where all the big uh, firms had their offices, Jardine Matheson office is there to this day. And the whole of those wicked colonial type era buildings are retained by the Chinese as national monuments. They haven't torn them down at all. But you look across the river. The well, Putong across the river is, uh, oh, mind boggling. Yep, 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 yep. Ab oh, that's no exaggeration. Yeah. Yep. And 10,000 pigs in the water, that was But Peking was pretty much the same with the geishas, with everything all the same. Geishas, uh, you're getting a bit ambitious here. Right? You've got <laughs> good memories. <laughs> well, I, I was a 17-year-old B.A.R. when I arrived in Peking. Right? Okay, okay. So geishas I'm normally never, associated I'm with... <laughs> normally associated with Japan, I'd say, but certainly there were dancing girls and... Uh, oh, it was everything. Uh, yeah, exactly. Leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> What did you trade with Japan? Japanese trade initially, Britain took from them curious things like seaweed, for example, tea. They valued uh, high quality cloth, silks, which seems amazing. But the British were able to introduce those from China and from their own sources. And so-called exotic goods, like ridiculous things like alarm clocks with crazy uh, uh, toys we would describe as today, but regarded by the Japanese with a certain amount of fascination. That was in very early times. Uh, rice, of course, they were always uh, anxious for cheaper sources of rice, though they exported rice as well. According to crop failures and one thing or another, you know, trade, it, it goes on according to weather very often, that sort of thing. But initially, uh, the Europeans were very keen on the tea and they took uh, some, some woolen goods, not much, 
when did the oil trade develop into China from Sarkozy vacuum? Oil was discovered first by in the east by the Dutch in Sumatra, just near Medan there in um, 1878, something like that, um, and it developed from there. The Dutch were the first off the mark with oil in the east, uh, in the southern coast of uh, Borneo too, Banjamassin, Ballet, Papam, those sort of places. So it was the um, Shell. What became Shell were, were the first off the mark with oil in the east. Sakoni Vacuum, I'm not sure, I don't know the corporate history, but that would be subsequent for sure. In the accepted sense, the Dutch had had their trading post at Nagasaki and the Americans, as I've just related, had for a couple of uh, years had had their consulate at Shimoda. Actual embassy uh, was the B British, I think, uh, established there at the next, pretty well, pretty close to the Shogunate Palace in uh, Yedo. Shimoda was the place of the government No, 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 no. That was why uh, Mr. Harris was kept away from the seat of power, if you like. He still had to make the journey into um, still had to make the journey from Shimoda into Tokyo. Shimoda's, if you like, tucked out of the way a bit, yeah. on purpose. Uh, that's Tokyo Bay. Uh, Tokyo Bay, Yedo Bay, yep, absolutely. Tokyo is just decent capital. Elgin harvest his uh, Greek marbles. Uh, that was dad. That was dad. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, yeah. He died in Elgin went on to be Viceroy of India. You know, he wasn't any slouch in the British administration. He was held in the highest regard. And he went on latterly to be Viceroy. In fact, he died in, in India of uh, heart, heart condition. Now, did the, the pan, um keep opium away from this country you hear it with China all the time because I would hear it with Japan. All right. Well thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John, very much. That's